Always they attacked. Always they sought to fight in the open, where they could use their horses. To be outnumbered meant nothing to them. The words of the late Irish historian G. A. Hayes McCoy, when he describes the Normans at the Battle of Dublin in 1171, and this is a story about the audacious actions of the Normans on that September day. According to Hayes McCoy, quote, the Norman strength at Dublin cannot in the early part of the year have greatly exceeded 2,000 or perhaps 200 knights, 400 other horsemen and 1,500 or so archers and other infantry. Earlier that year, the Dublin Vikings, supported by Vikings from the Northern Isles, had been defeated by the Normans outside the gates of Dublin, and Earl Hasculf, their leader, was executed by the Normans. During the summer of 1171, Rory O'Connor, the High King of Ireland, blockaded Dublin town with large forces. He had brought up his own Connacht men and lay encamped with them at Castle Knock. The leader of the Normans was a man nicknamed Strongbow. Strongbow's opponents were very numerous. Contemporaries placed a force commanded by Rory alone at 30,000, some say 60,000. Hayes McCoy, the historian, doubts the 30,000 figure. You must remember that most accounts were given by Gerald of Wales, and Gerald of Wales was in the Norman camp, somewhat of a propagandist. And of course, history is always written by the victors. But Rory and his allies represented the best of the Irish fighters and they were well placed north and south of the Liffey to enforce the blockade of Dublin. There seems to have been no possibility of an Irish assault. Attacking fortifications was not an Irish speciality. The impression given by the meagre accounts which we have of the events of the summer is of two months blockade or siege during which little if any serious fighting occurred. Rory's seeming inactivity was not however without effect. In Dublin supplies ran short blockaded by land and sea, and experiencing, as well as the momentary displeasure of King Henry II, which prevented the dispatch of supplies from England, the Normans had to tighten their belts. Henry II's fear was that Strongbow was trying to make his own kingdom to rival that of England. In September, Strongbow offered to negotiate with the High King, but Rory overestimated his own strength and he tried to gain too much. He proposed peace on the condition that Strongbow and his intruders might retain Dublin, Wexford and Waterford, but no more. It was contrary to every inclination of the Normans to accept a condition such as this, which would coop them up behind walls. They reacted, in the spirit of the enterprise to which they were committed, aggressively. Hayes McCoy quotes one of the Norman leaders who says, What are we waiting for? cried Morris Fitzgerald. Do we expect help from our own people? No, this is how we stand. We are Englishmen to the Irish, and Irishmen to the English. And that statement, to the English we are Irish, and to the Irish we are English, is the lament of many a Briton living in Ireland today. They were abandoned by King Henry II to fend for themselves, and if they wanted better terms than Rory offered, they must fight for them. And so a Norman force sallied suddenly from Dublin at one o'clock on a September afternoon and attacked the High King. They went out in three divisions, the ubiquitous formation that became right, left and centre in action. Raymond Le Gros led with 20 knights, Miles de Cogan followed with 30, Strongbow and Morris Fitzgerald led the third division, the main body or centre of 40 knights. Each had other troops as well horsemen and archers. The force crossed the Liffey Bridge and moved northwards towards Finglas. Soon they turned to the left, whether they're beyond the Tolka River or still south of it, when they turned, we do not know. Moving rapidly in the Tolka Valley behind the present Phoenix Park, they came down heavily and unexpectedly on Rory's camp at Castle Knock. So the Normans employed a tactic known as the shock cavalry charge. This required the knights to ride literally knee touching knee in a very tight formation. The intention being to try and literally shake the ground beneath the feet of the enemy soldiers facing them in the hope that the enemy might break rank and run away. If they didn't, the enemy soldiers would face a literal wall of horses hitting them like a wave hitting a headland but it required the knights to ride with extreme discipline 
because if one section of the charge met the enemy before a following section, the whole effect could be lost. So this required great skill and discipline on the part of the knights to execute. Besides the shock charge, the Norman horse were also thought to have been able to execute feigned flight, that is, to charge, but at the last moment to turn around, giving the enemy the impression that they were in retreat, thus causing the enemy to break formation in pursuit, only for the Norman cavalry to turn back and recharge. Some historians believe this tactic may have been used to break the shield wall of the Anglo-Saxons at Hastings in 1066. So to execute a cavalry charge requires great skill and training. And remember, medieval armies didn't train like we would know modern armies today that do field exercises and manoeuvres. So it's thought that the Normans employed what were called Conroys. These were small groups of men at a local level who would practice small-scale battle formations so that when they came together for larger formations, everybody knew what they were doing. And this greatly enhanced the performance of the Normans on the battlefield. How the Irish reacted we do not know, but we are told that there was great confusion, and there seems little doubt that the Irish casualties were very large. The High King was caught in his bath in the Tolka River. The indignity of his situation seems heightened by every schoolboy's knowing of it, but he escaped. The slaughter of the fugitives continued until evening, by which time the Irish were routed, the Normans came back to Dublin in the darkness of the autumn evening, laden with food and the spoils of battle and covered with glory. The other Irish armies which lay around Dublin disintegrated and the siege was soon lifted. The Normans had proved their military prowess in Ireland with superior weapons and tactics. But how would they hold their new ground? I will continue this story in this playlist, The Storm and Normans, at a later date. But for now, thank you for taking the time to watch. Henry II's fear was that <clears throat> was that Rambo. Henry II's fear was that Strongbow was trying to create.